Daily Minutes nummer 1540 met een uitzending voor vandaag 3 februari 2019. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. Today's bulletin will be for the major part in English. De uitzending is vandaag grotendeels in het Engels. Aan het eind vandaag is er twee keer SSTV in PD90. Deze twee afbeeldingen worden aanstaande zaterdag ook uitgezonden bij Slow Scan Radio. Het wat gelikter klinkende RSTB-nieuws van TX Factor is vandaag nog niet beschikbaar. Vandaag dat we het vandaag met de reguliere versie doen. Dat is de versie die ik de laatste jaren ook steeds via PI2 NOS gebruikt heb. Daarna een aflevering van de podcast Darknet Diaries over het fenomeen hacken met het ongelofelijke verhaal van Mopman die als jeugdige hacker wraak nam op het telefoonbedrijf AT&T vanwege een onterechte zeer hoge telefoonrekening en die daarvoor meerdere keren de gevangenis in gaat. Maar het kwam zo te horen toch nog goed met hem. En uiteindelijk gaf AT&T... Nou ja, luister maar zelf. CQ, CQ, CQ. Calling all radio amateurs and shortwave listeners. This is GB2RS, the news broadcasting service of the Radio Society of Great Britain. It's read to you as usual by G4NJH. The script of the broadcast is available on the RSGB's own website and at gb2rs.podbean.com. This is GB2RS News. Good morning. It's Sunday the 3rd of February 2019. Here are the main news headlines. Enter Club of the Year. 50 years of news reading. Nominate for CW Ops Award. This year's RSGB Club of the Year competition has just one category for entrance. As well as being able to open to clubs of all sizes, entries are welcome from all RSGB affiliated groups. The theme is Meeting RSGB Strategy 2022. Entries must be received by the 28th of February, so there's still time to put in an entry. Clubs should read the rules on the RSGB website and send their entries to their regional representative. The RSGB would like to thank Walters and Stantons for their continued sponsorship of this competition. Victor Gracie, GI3WEM, is stepping down as one of the, R- the GB2RS newsreaders for the for Northern Ireland after around 50 years of news reading. The RSGB would like to thank Victor for his services to his fellow amateur and wish him well in his retirement. The RSGB is therefore looking to find a replacement news reader in the area as soon as possible. Grant Smith, MI0AWL, will continue as a backup reader when necessary. If you're interested in this volunteer role, please contact the RSGB um, uh, sorry, contact the, uh, the GB2RS manager, that is, Ken Hatton G3VBA, by email to gb2rs.manager at rsgb.org.uk. CW Ops is now accepting nomination for the CW Ops Award for Advancing the Art of CW. The purpose of the award is to recognise individuals, groups or organisations that have made the greatest contribution or contributions towards advancing the art or practice of radio communications by Morse code. Anyone can make a nomination and it should be emailed to awards at cwops.org with a copy to secretary at cwops.org. In order to be considered, a nomination must be received by the 1st of March. Details of what to include in your nominations you can find at cwops.org. The RSGB's EMC committee has updated its advice leaflet number 15 on VDSL interference. This leaflet explains how to recognise VDSL interference and summarises the measures that people have found that have helped to reduce the interference. It must be emphasised these things that you can try, they're not guaranteed to eliminate the problem at all locations. Indeed, in some locations, none of the suggestions reduce the problem significantly. It can be found via the EMC publication page on the RSGB website where you can find links to other EMCC publications on VDSL. There's still time to organise a thinking day on the air station, which takes place over the weekend of the 16th and 17th of February. Currently, as well as UK stations, guides and scouts are taking part from Canada, USA and the Netherlands. A list of known stations is displayed on the station list page of the website guides-on-the-air.co.uk. 
Six News 138 is now available for UK Six Metre Group members to download from their website. It contains 47 pages of news and comment dedicated to Six Metres. Get it from www.uksmg.org. One area where the IARU and RSGB volunteers have been active is regarding concerns from wireless power transmission, or WPT. The latest development is the recent approval and publication of CPT ECC Report 289 on how high power WPT for electric vehicles, EV. Following a major effort and numerous contributions to CPT meetings, this has, had, this has significant content regarding amateur radio and concerns on spurious emissions. Comments by IARU Region 1 RSGB and Ofcom were included during the final consultation stage. The report is a key element on, in ongoing work for WRC 19 Agenda Item 9.1.1 on WPT EV. It can be downloaded along with many other CEPT documents from www.echo.db.dk. Now for details of rallies and events in the coming week, today the 3rd of February, the 35 Sears Canvey Radio and Electronics Rally will be held at its new venue, which is Cornelius Vermuden School, Dinant Avenue, Canvey Island, Essex, SS89 QS, admission £3, doors open 10am or 15 minutes earlier for disabled visitors. There's a free car parking and easy ground level access to two large halls, Tea, coffee, soft drinks, bacon, butters will be available. There'll be radio computing and electronic training, traders and special interest groups. More details via email from Tony at TonyStreet.net. If you're fortunate enough to be heading to Florida on holiday in the next week, you may be interested to know that the 73rd Orlando Camcation runs from the 8th to the 10th of February. Head for the Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park, Park, 4603 West Colonial Drive, Orlando. That's Florida 32808 in the USA. There'll be over 150 commercial sellers, over 200 swap table vendors, and the largest tailgate area in the southeastern US. For details, see www.hamcation, that's H-A-M-C-A-T-I-O-N.com. Next Sunday the 10th, the Harwell Radio and Electronics Rally will take place at Didcot Leisure Centre, Mealand Road, Didcot, Didcot in Oxfordshire, ox 11 ay just three miles from Milton Interchange on the A34. Doors open at 10am, inter- admittance is £3, with under 12s free. There will be traders, special interest groups and RSGB bookstand. Refreshments available all day, talking 145.550, Using G3PIA, details from Anne, G8NVI, by email to rally at g3pia.net. To get your event into RADCOM, into GB2RS, or on the website, please send details as early as possible to radcom at rsgb.org.uk. We need to know about four months in advance, though, for publications in RADCOM. Now DX News from 425 DX News and other sources. PJ4 stroke WW4 A sorry, PJ4 stroke WW4 LL and PJ4 stroke NN9 DD will be active from Bonaire, IOTA SA006 between the 4th and 10th of February. They'll be operating FT8 RITI SSB in all bands and will participate in the CQWPX RITI contest on the 7th and 10th as PJ4Z. QSL's VAR Logbook of the World, or K4BAI. Mike W1USN Bob AA1M will be active as Stroke T, uh, TI5 from Atenas in Costa Rica until the 13th of February. They'll operate CWSSB, some digital, possibly a um, few of the FM satellites, QSL via Logbook of the World, or via the Home Call Signs Direct or Bureau. Bogdan SP2FUD and Zen SP2GCJ will be active as XV9FUD and XV9T, respectively, from Vietnam between the 4th and 18th of February. They'll be operating CWSSB in digital 40 to 12 metre bands, QSL via Logbook of the World, Club Logs, OQRS, or via SP2GCJ. 
The three-man team will operate from Manus Island, OC025, in Papua New Guinea, as P29VCX, until the 5th of February. This will be followed by P29NI from Daru Island, which is OC153. From the 6th to the 11th of February, QSL requests in each case should be sent directly to Sugar Mike 6 cvx Now, a special news event. Special event news even. Look for TM16AAW to be on the air from the 10th to the 24th of February, celebrating the 16th Antarctic Activity Week. Francois FADVD will be operational from Macon in the east part of France using the 10 to 40 meter bands, mostly SSB. All info on this event can be found on QRZ.com. Ari Fidenza and the Guglielmo Marconi Foundation are running an award scheme based major Italian pioneers something wrong with that sentence uh, based upon perhaps or based something major Italian pioneers and their discoveries uh, based on I think it was their discoveries in wireless and radio technology running throughout the year each month is dedicated to a specific scientist February celebrates Augusto Righi further details at www.arifidenza.it Please send special event details to radcom at rsgb.org.uk as early as possible for free publicity on GB2RS in Radcom and online. Remember that UK special event stations do have to be open to the public, so our free publicity can help you make your efforts more widely known. Contest news today, the 3rd of Feb, the 432 Megs AFS contest runs from 0900 to 1300 UTC. All modes, the exchange of signal report, serial number and locator. On Monday, the 80 metre club championships run from 2000 to 2130 UTC. SSB leg and the exchange of signal report, serial number and locator. On Tuesday, the 144 Megs FM activity contest runs from 1900 to 1955 UTC using FM only. The exchange of signal report, serial number and locator. Running concurrently is the 144 Megs Machine Generated Mode Activity Contest, which has an exchange of signal report and four character locator. These contests are immediately followed by the All Mode 144 Megs UK Activity Contest, which runs from 2000 to 2230 UTC. The exchange for this contest is also signal report, serial number, and locator. Wednesday, the UK UK EI Contest Club 80 Meter Contest runs from 2000 to 2100 UTC using SSB only. The exchange is your four character locator. On Saturday the 9th, the first 1.8 megs contest takes place 1900 to 2300 UTC, CW only. The exchange is signal report serial number in your district. Next weekend sees two contests. The CW Worldwide WPX RITI Contest runs for 48 hours from 0000 UTC on the 9th to 2359 UTC on the 10th, using 3.5 to 28 megs contest bands, the exchange of signal report and serial number. The PACC contest runs for 24 hours from 1200 UTC on the 9th to 1200 UTC on the 10th, using CW and SSB on the 1.8 to 28 megs contest bands, the exchange of signal report and serial number with PA station sending their province. Now, the propagation report compiled by G0KYHE3YLA and G4BAO. Last week was a mixed bag in terms of HF propagation. The solar flux index was a little higher at 74, helped by a sunspot group that has now rotated out of view. Geomagnetic conditions were very settled in the first half of the week, with the KP index often sitting at zero. It seems quite a while since the index was this low, but that couldn't last as, every, as a very large elongated coronal hole on the sun's equator threatened the Earth with an enhanced solar wind. This eventually came to fruition, fruition on the Thursday afternoon. That pushed the KP index to 3 at first and then 5 overnight, bringing minor G1 geomagnetic storming at higher latitudes. At the time of writing this, it looks as though it is likely to bring continued unsettled HF conditions across the weekend, complete with depressed maximum usable frequencies. NOAA predicts a solar flux index of around 72 next week as the solar minimum continues. The good news is that once the effects of this coronal hole disappear, we can expect more settled geomagnetic conditions and a return to seasonal averages when it comes to maximum usable frequencies. 
The low bands are still at their optimum, with 160, 80 and 40 providing good propagation opportunities. 60 metres, or the 5 megs bands, is also providing into G and European contacts during the day, as the critical frequency is often sufficient to support propagation on the band. Higher up, 20 metres is still the best band for reliable DX, although it tends to open late and close early at the moment, with occasional openings on 17 and perhaps even 15 metres. VHF and up, it's looking like a week to be getting on with those hardware and software projects in the warmth of the workshop whilst keeping an eye on the VHFDX clusters. Cold and unsettled would describe the first part of the week with limited options for tropo due to some wintry areas of low pressure. There are signs of a weak ridge of high pressure to the south of Britain at the start of the week, but this offers only marginal chances for paths to the south from southern England into the continent and Spain. With the solar conditions, the weekend is looking likely to offer some chances of aurora due to the large coronal hole, so even if Tropo is not a strong contender, there still are some uh, possible interests for VHF ops. For gigahertz band enthusiasts, the snow showers early on may provide some rain scatter. The moon is at apogee on Tuesday and declination is negative, but rising all week. Moon windows will lengthen as the week progresses, but paths path losses will be at their highest. One minor meteor shower occurs on the 8th, the Alpha Centaurids, but with a zenithal hour, hour rate of just 6, it's not really a significant one for meteor scatter operation. And that's it from the propagation team this week, and that's all from me until next week also. Computers aren't always right. They make mistakes, encounter errors, and crash. Sometimes the errors can be frustrating especially when the computer is at a big company and it makes a billing error that says you owe them a thousand dollars. And when that corporation won't admit it's their mistake and insists you pay for the bill that you didn't create, this can be infuriating. But what can you do when you try to fight it but the corporation refuses to admit it's their problem? Well, some hackers know exactly what to do. These are true stories from the dark side of the internet. I'm Jack Recider. This is Darknet Diaries. Hey. Yo, what up? You want to tell us your name? Everybody calls me Mob Man. Hacking changed Mob Man's life. But to understand how it changed his life, we need to go back to when he was just a kid. All right, so I started off, you know, I'm, I'm a little kid. I'm like eight, nine years old. Got a Nintendo, right? You know, the old NES square box, blowing a cartridge, you know, push it in a few times. I was addicted to video games, like nonstop. So I'd sneak out in the middle of the night and go play it while, you know, my mom's asleep. His mom would catch him doing this and take his Nintendo away. Little mob man was addicted, so I'll go find it and then, uh, you know, skip school just to play the video games. Very sneaky kid, so I was like the devil. And then uh, eventually, she took a hammer <laughs> and smashed the shit out of <laughs> the Nintendo. <laughs> so, you know, that was my first, you know, computer. So I, I, I got to see the insides, look at it, take it all apart, try to figure out how to get it to back to working and stuff. Um, that did not happen. (laughs) It did not get fixed, but I learned a little bit about it. So, um, then the next thing was, you know, I got a computer. Um, then I started playing a game called Ultima Online. Uh, it's a massive multiplayer role-playing game. A lot of people now, they would be able to relate to it as like World of Warcraft, except in Ultima Online, if you die, they could take all your stuff and pretty much leave you naked and bear. As you might have guessed, Mob Man became addicted to Ultima Online. As a teenager, he found himself playing it every chance he could. The computer breaks, and the mom's like, I ain't paying somebody to fix it because he broke it like three or four other times. I had to learn how to fix all that stuff and like how the actual operating system works. He gets it working again and starts taking an interest in computers. He learned how to do a little programming and troubleshoot problems on the computer. But still, he finds himself playing Ultima Online all the time. 
Now back then, to be online, you need a phone and a modem to connect to the internet. So he'd often hear his mom shouting, Phone's busy. I know you're on that damn game. Follow, you know, so she'll go and disconnect the phone. So I'll go outside and I found the little phone box thing and I'll splice the cables of the neighbors and run them into ours so then I could use their telephone. After years of playing Ultima Online and using his computer every day for hours a day, he started to become pretty good at computers. And he started visiting some of the more popular online bulletin boards and chat rooms and learning how to do different hacks, like making free phone calls and stuff. And he started learning that software has exploits. So what does he do? So in Ultima Online, so me and my buddies, we'll sit out there and we'll figure out ways to exploit the game. We'll hide out in front of people's houses, stealth our way, which which you basically turn invisible, and we'll wait out and outside somebody's house, their door, when they opened it. And then we'll just walk inside their door, invisible, and then wait for them to leave, and then steal all their shit. We built our own scams. Like we'll pull up like the trading window to trade somebody for stuff, and then like we'll close it, and then like their stuff will be too heavy and it'll fall and drop on the ground, or they can't move and we'll just kill them and then take it. So eventually, we, we, you know, we bought a boat in the game. You could have a boat. You could, like, sail around and do shit. And there's a little, like, a cargo bay, like, in front of the boat. And you can store your shit in it. And it works like a house. Like, you have to have a key or whatever. And you can open, close the, you know, lock it, whatever. So you can't get in. But we learned if you park a boat, uh, the bow in front of another bow of another boat, and you're standing on your boat, apparently your privileges of your boat links over to their boat. And you could like open their cargo and take all their shit. So we spent like a couple weeks just going and hitting every boat on the whole damn server and stealing everybody's stuff. Players could open tickets and complain on the forums, but my man and his pirating friends never got caught doing this. He made a lot of in-game money stealing from all these players, and he wanted to show off his epic loot. So we made a website showcasing what he had. So we take snippets of the game, and, and that's how I started learning action script and Flash. And put some music behind it and release them all up on, online on our GeoCities websites. Then we used to hack each other's websites and take them down and stuff. <laughs> in the 90s, when you play Ultima Online, it asks if you want to save your login so you don't have to type it in next time. And if you do this, it actually saves your username and password in a clear text file called uo.cfg. So we figured that out, and we're like, oh, cool. So if we get other people's uo.config file, because there's some idiots at school that play it, we could log in as them. Now we have all the ingredients for a fresh baked hack. Mob Man is now one part computer tech, two parts griefer, one part programmer, and a dash of greediness. His mission is to somehow take that uo.cfg file from other players online. So he mixed all this together and created a pretty clever program. It's a remote access tool, and it was a Trojan horse virus. He built a program that would allow him to take control of another computer. You could open and close the CD-ROM. You could flip the screen. You could hide the start button. You could move the mouse on their screen and you know click around. You could open up their C drive, um, change their wallpaper. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. He also connected it to ICQ, a common messaging app back then. And when they get infected with it, it'll send you an ICQ uh, message and it'll tell you their IP address and that they're online. Mobman called his virus Sub7. Now that he spent some time creating it, it was time to put it to work. So in Ultima Live, we'll stand by bank. So we'll go by there like, oh man, we got, because we were rich in the game. Like we had castles and millions of gold and all of our characters were like badass because because of our thievery and and stealing everybody's stuff from like the boats and the the other things and killing everybody and stuff so people are like how do you get all that stuff you know we're like oh no we got we made this little program and it gives you unlimited gold we're like hey do you want it and we're like yeah 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 and we're like cool what's your icq you know we'll send it over to you so you know we'll message them and then we'll send them the exe and then We'll put up like an error code, file not found, error, you know, okay, cancel or whatever. And then we'll send them the thing. So they'll run it and they'll be like, oh, it didn't work. Like it gave me some error. And then they'll run it again, infecting themselves again, and then run it again. And then they affected themselves like three or four, like 
people infect themselves like 10 times before they figure out like, oh, I guess it just doesn't work. I'm like, oh, man, I, I must have i'm missing a file i forgot to send it to you then like you give up or whatever then they go off on their own merry merry way you know and then you remove them off icq and be like oh sorry i guess the hack didn't work once that player is infected mob man would swoop in and grab the uo.cfg file which contained the username and password of that player you're looking for other cheater people that want to cheat in the game and you tell them that you have the cheat for them and i think that still goes on to this day like i mean you see like Minecraft and all those other stupid things like YouTube videos out there and they're like, oh, we got this hack, get free gold or sort of wall hacks and shit. And then all those are infected with some type of malware or whatnot. You know, you can scan them. Um, so, I mean, it, it's the same typical thing. But I mean, that's just how we came up with, you know, doing this stuff back then. Now, nobody else was doing that. Keep in mind, like we came up with that method. <laughs> to like to like say hey are you gonna get cheats here you go here's the file run it and then they'll log in and then you know i mean there's some stories you know i'll log into people we'll we'll log in real quick take all their stuff i'll have a couple guys standing by the bank we'll just steal all their things you know go to their house and then i'll go and like delete their characters like they, these people spend like years like leveling up their dudes and stuff and i just like delete confirm yes or no yes gone there's no recovery. You're like you're, it's over. Like I would, I would probably commit suicide if that happened to my account. Oh, you're so cold, man. Dude, I I look back and like it's like, oh my god, those poor little kids. <laughs> you know, it's it's so bad. So I'll delete all their shit, and then we'll like we'll make a new character, and like you know, dress it up like with a skirt or something or whatever. You know, just fuck with them, and, and then they eventually figure it out. What they figured out is that they've been hacked, and that somebody logged into their account, stole all their items, and deleted their character. This would be a character that they had worked on for years, and it's all of a sudden gone. High-level players that were wiped out by Mob Man and hit with this Sub-7 virus must have felt a level of rage like no other. But they, they can't prove or know anything. And then I can't even keep up. I get so many people, I had so many people that I had coming back to me where I could go and log into their accounts. Not just their accounts in UO, but I could log into their computers. Now, I don't really log into computers, but there were a couple times where like, they, some of them have webcams and I'll turn on their webcam because that was another option. You could like turn on their webcam and watch them. <laughs> so, you know, I, I see like their bobs be up on their computer, you know, watching some uh, sexual stuff. <laughs> you know, going on AOL. <laughs> I can tell you some stories on that, you know. This sub-7 virus was working really well for Mobman. He was able to social engineer dozens of players to install the virus. And he was able to take tons of in-game items and gold from them. Right, so I started getting overwhelmed in the UO. I started making so much bank. You know, so much money and being like awesome and getting all these people and stuff like that. You know, I wanted to share it with my other buddies, you know, the, my friends that were in my clan or a guild uh, that that we we had. So I, I sent it to those those ding dongs on ICQ. I'm like, here, here's the, you know, here's the client. Here's how you use it. You know, go start sending it to people. Uh, you know, do what I do. Y'all been hanging out. You all see how it works and stuff because we're all on ICQ. So um so they started using it and then sending it to people and then apparently they sent it to their friends and their friends sent it to their friends and then they built the fucking website <laughs> and started giving it away to everybody <laughs> and stuff like that and the next thing i know everybody knows about sub seven like i i see other idiots in uo like oh hey you want to get a cheat and blah blah blah, blah. I'm like huh sure yeah what's your icu number and like you know they'll they'll try to send it to me and infect me with it and i'm like that's fucking pretty awesome those i don't have to talk with my friends because i told them not to give it out <laughs> but they did so they gave it out it spread i'm not the one that like kind of like gave it away to everybody if you will or made the website or anything that was my ding dong juvenile delinquent friends even though sub seven was created to steal ultima online logins mob man had built a lot of features into it like the ability to grab any file change files upload files and turn the webcam on 
So Sub-7 started to spread and was used by all kinds of different people for all kinds of different reasons. Some students would infect their teachers with it and change their grades. They sent it to their friend and they're playing the cup holder game <laughs> with the opening and closing the CD-ROM. They got them inspired and interested in computers, you know, because they have to learn social engineering. You have to convince somebody to open the file and run it. And it, it got people learning about the operating systems. But some people already knew how computers worked and took this to the next level, infecting dozens and hundreds of people at a time. You can attach it to anything though. First there's a button like browse, and then you pick like an executable, like calculator. And then you click meld, and it'll meld the, the malware with the executable. And the executable will still run and act normal, except it has sub seven infects you when you run it. You know, you know, I start thinking about some of the stuff I downloaded back in the where's days. I'm pretty sure I probably downloaded this and- Oh yeah, you got infected. Well, yeah. <laughs> As a kid, I did download a lot of shady things and ran them. And as I think back, I do remember getting my grandma's computer infected with the Sub-7 virus and having to learn how to wipe it off. I never thought I'd ever meet the maker of that virus that hit me in 2002. This is why, even today, you should never run a program that you don't trust, because it could infect you with Sub-7 or another Trojan. This malware that Mobman made was spreading all over the internet like an unchecked disease. My man only used Sub7 to steal Ultima Online logins for himself. He never used it to steal anyone's credit cards, bank statements, or anything like that. It's like, I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't know, I just don't like stealing credit, like, you know, money or, or things from them. But because all, like, all through online, I didn't think of it like that because it was like virtual, right? Because it was like on the internet. I don't know, I think of like my grandma. I always get the image of like, my little old lady grandma and like if somebody would rob her I would kill that person you know what I mean mob man finished high school with good grades but his obsession with video games grew stronger because he was tapping into his neighbor's phone lines and spending all night on the computer his relationship with his parents evaporated oh yeah they don't ever talk to me during all that whole time like they I was I was disowned as a child <laughs> because of this he hardly ever went home no, I wasn't. I mean, most of the time I was staying over at my girlfriend's, you know, apartment or whatever, or out over at friends' houses, couch surfing, trying to get on that internet. He was drawn like a moth to a flame, and he would go wherever he could find free internet access. Video games ruined my Ultima Online ruined my life, <laughs> or my early livelihood. <laughs> I'm like 18 at this, or I was about to turn 18, and I got a cell phone. I was 17. They let me sign the contract because they're idiots. And I thought you had to be 18 to sign a legal binding contract. I got a phone bill. It was like 900 bucks. And that's a lot of money. He looks at the bill and it says he called Kansas and some other states for an ungodly amount of time. I never, I don't know anybody in Kansas or Arkansas or wherever the hell. <laughs> like I didn't make these calls. So he decides to refute the bill with AT&T. Let me call them up and see what the hell this $900 charge is or whatever. And they said I called somebody in like Kansas or Wisconsin or... It's like, I don't even know anybody up in that state. I did not call somebody up there for 20 hours. So you need to remove this $900 bill charge on my phone. And they're like, no, sir, we're not going to do that. You made that call and you're going to have to pay it or you're, we're not going to give you service. And I'm like, well, I'm not even 18. You signed this contract, so I don't have to pay it anyway. And they're like, well, then we're going to disconnect you altogether. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to log in and change it myself. And they're like, we're, we got smarter people working here than you. You're not even, you know, you're a young punk kid and stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I hang up. By this point, Mob Man has developed a complex because of his previous online exploits. He was thinking to himself, I made this sub seven. I fucking own everything in Ultima Online, like the greatest game ever. And after he hangs up with AT&T, he feels powerless against this large corporation. He honestly didn't make the calls they claim he did. And there's nothing he can do about it except pay it. So rage brews inside him. And he just heard AT&T tell him that their systems are too secure for him to hack into. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> they think 
they're smarter and better than me and they can push me around. I didn't make these calls, you know, and, and whatever. So I get on my vengeful, you know, upset. I see red. Mob man got a list of AT&T phone numbers that had modems on them. So he would use his computer to dial the number and see if it connected. This is called war dialing. He would go down the list, dialing number after number to see if it connected to any computer in the AT&T network. So I sat all night logging into different PBXs, calling up all kinds of weird exchanges. And I get into a couple of them. And every once in a while, he would connect to an AT&T system. And amazingly enough, the systems he accessed did not have a username or password. So when you dialed into it, it would immediately give you a command prompt. Yeah, it just throws you in. Dude, there's no fucking security back then, man. There was no nothing, ever. This was an operating system Mobman had never seen before. Some weird AT&T terminal or something. So he didn't know any commands. Yeah, I'm typing like question mark and help and stuff. And then like it gives you a little list of commands. And then you, like, you type in that command and type help. You know, and you keep getting lists of different stuff. And try to figure out what everything freaking does. He keeps getting access to one system after another. And he's exploring and learning the AT&T network, studying it, mapping it, and he keeps going deeper. Man, if they had Red Bulls back then, I mean, I'd be just thought more Red Bulls. It's just a natural high. It's just like, I don't know, you're just, you're just doing it. You know, it's just like the whole world closed off. I get enveloped and closed into that. Like, I don't, it, it's, it's me, the computer, that's it. Like, you could be, the house is on fire, and I wouldn't even know. Mob Man spends eight hours gaining access into AT&T's network, slowly making progress, but still nothing significant yet. Eventually, I typed in the wrong command. <laughs> and at that same moment, the computer he dialed into went offline. And nothing worked. And then I tried dialing some of the other numbers that I was able to connect to prior to some of the other machines, and they were all off too. So then I thought it was me. So I tried calling in from a different address and then that didn't work um then i decided to give him a call call up at&t customer support again <laughs> see if they could fix my phone bill <laughs> so i got them on the line and again we're not fixing your bill blah blah blah, blah. You made these calls and then the mic i did not blah, blah, blah. but hey how's your all's network over there in california and and Nevada and stuff. And they're like, well, we just have a big network outage over there. It's been out for a couple hours. He realized the commands he typed on that computer had caused a major outage at at and And apparently it rewrote the firmware on it and bricked like a, one of these central switching PBXs, which happened to run like the whole like West Coast uh, telephone systems or something. I'm like, oh, really? Well, if you want to know why, I'll tell you if you fix my phone bill. <laughs> so, you know, and, um, you know, so I get in there and I start bragging. I brag to them. You know, I, I, I sit there and I tell them what I did and, and all stuff. And obviously, I gave him my name, my phone number, and all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> obviously, that's one of the situations you probably reflected back on a lot. What do you, what do you think about that now? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, don't be an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, nowadays, obviously, you got VPNs and all that shit. You know, if you want to do something illegal, I mean, I could, I could definitely get away with stuff if I want to now, but um, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't do anything illegal. Support for this episode comes from the Transatlantic Cable Podcast. This is the one put on by Kaspersky Labs. Did you know when you connect to a website on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, those packets travel over a big old cable stretched across the whole ocean? Yeah, no kidding. That's what a transatlantic cable is. And there's actually dozens of these cables that go all the way across the ocean. I often wonder if there's some kind of listening device on one of those cables, somehow sniffing all the traffic that's going across the ocean. Anyways, the Transatlantic Cable Podcast is a weekly InfoSec podcast covering interesting security news and topics, and they wrap it all up in under 20 minutes. 
They dive into topics like breaches, hacking stories, privacy, and a bunch of other stories that affect us all. And the best part is that it's put on by two guys from Kaspersky Labs, one of the leaders in malware research, so you know it's got to be good. So put your ears onto this one and listen to Transatlantic Cable Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. My man told AT&T how he hacked into their systems, gave his name and phone number, and waited for them to call him back so that they could remove the charges from his phone bill. He sat there after hanging up. No, I I mean, I'm still upset. Like, they didn't fix my shit. You know, I hacked all their stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for them to call me back. So I just get back on and, like, keep trying to do other shit, you know, hack and do stuff. And then I think I went and played some Ultima Online afterwards. (laughs) You know, whatever, you know. A few days go by. Still no call back from AT and T. Yeah, my my friends, my girlfriend, and my mom got a visit from like a detective or an FBI guy or something, and left them their business cards. I was like, I was like, oh shit, oh shit. What am I going to do? So I had a job. I forgot what I was doing. I was like working at Taco Bell or some shit. And you know these 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 detective people were looking for me. And I was worried that I'm going to get picked up. I'm going to get arrested. I don't know what's happening. So I said, all right, well, let me face, you know, let me confront it, you know. So I had lots of friends, um, computer friends. One of them lived in Washington and there was a library in Washington. And apparently that library had a database that you, a little computer that was like the white pages. And you could type, put in anybody's name or phone number, reverse lookup, front lookup, whatever, sideways, whatever you want to do. You know, it's like it has everybody's information. Mobman uses this computer to look up the information on the detective that's looking for him. And I get his house phone number and his address and stuff. And I call him at his house at like three o'clock in the morning. And he's asleep. But he answers the phone. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And I heard you're looking for me. And he's like, yeah, we're, uh, we, I just want to talk to you about AT&T. Like they said that you were having some issues with them. And, and I think, why don't you meet me up with, uh, get a cup of coffee and we could go over, you know, this stuff. And I'm like, dude, I'm not stupid. Like you've been looking for me for like a month and knocking on all my friends doors and shit. And I think you're going to arrest me. So I'm not going to meet up with you with some coffee. Like, I'm not stupid. And he's like, all right, yeah. I mean, I get it. We, you are wanted. And I'm going to have to, you know, take you in and stuff. Uh, where are you? I'll come and get you. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you where I am. I'm not stupid. Again, I'm going to alliterate that. <laughs> but, however, I get my paycheck Friday. And I'll meet you at my girlfriend's apartment complex on Saturday at the pool and I'll turn myself in. And he's like, okay, well, where do you work? Like, you know, and I'm like, dude, really? Like, and I hang up. He wanted to do the right thing. He didn't want to be a criminal or a fugitive. He just wanted to face this problem. He thought he might go to jail. So he spent the next few days stashing all his computer files and safe spots all around the internet and sorting out any loose ends. I was just like, all right, well, I went and got my paycheck and I went in that Saturday and went to the the pool and like I went and walked in there. And they came like they had like SWAT team there, like a bunch of dudes with machine guns and surrounded me basically and put me in the back. What what did you what did you think as soon as you saw like a SWAT team? No, no, I was just like I'm frozen. I'm just like whatever. I'm just standing there. What am I going to do? <laughs> Pull out my nine and start shooting at him? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I just. just like, <laughs> I would just be so scared. Like, why are there people pointing guns at me? I don't know. I don't care. I mean, it's cool. My girlfriend, she's there, you know, walking up. They let me, you know, kiss and hug my girlfriend goodbye. And they give me my cell phone. Like, they're letting me make calls in the back of the cop car. I'm calling up like my buddies. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to jail, you know. Send me, write me a letter or something. Then they took me to jail. His girlfriend was not happy to see him arrested at her pool. Yeah, she was sad. 
and she was good like she kept she came to the jail and visited me a lot and all that stuff so so my man was questioned and taken to jail it sunk in like the first like you know couple days like two or three days it's like man i'm missing people and blah blah blah, blah. but then it becomes like a whole different world inside of jail it has its own ecosystem if you will you know so you start learning all the stuff in there and 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 whatnot and i was i was like the pretty cool guy in jail i mean i'm a a young skinny nerdy fucking dude but nobody fucked with me at all because i was like the cool hacker guy that could like when they get out we could all hook up and like make lots of money and do shit so everybody wanted to be like my friend um so i mean i had it made i I mean i was good in chess i learned pinochle uh played dominoes i got sent to lockdown a few times uh that was fun got to hang out with all the murder people um you know so it's it, it, it was an experience so it opens your eyes you learn i learned how to become humble and very respectful in there. Strangely enough, he was still able to get on a computer while in jail. Some of the guards there, the officers, they were going to school for computers or they had a computer there and they want to learn stuff. And who's the guy they come and talk to about learning things? This guy. Which was a lot of fun for Mob Man. Hell yeah! They let me go hang out, play on the computer, show them things. You know, and then there was the law library. Law library was amazing. Um, And that had the internet, but you couldn't get on the internet. So I had to hack the computer locally. I remember how I did that was um, magnifying glass. Yeah, magnify.exe. I deleted magnify and renamed cmd.exe to magnify. And then I went back to the login screen. And then you hit like Windows H and it brings up the accessibility magnify, which was actually command prompt and system launched it for me. So now I have like admin of their little law library computer. Then I got everybody's name, address, all the, I mean, well, not everybody, but like all the correctional officers like got in their HR department and got all their information, printed that out. Um, signed up for like pretty much every magazine on the planet. Like the mail that I got every day was like bags, like those big garbage bags full of mail. How'd you pay for that? (laughs) But cash on delivery, bro. Back then you sign up, you know, sample subscription, whatever done every magazine back then, you know, magazines were a thing. Uh, so yeah, so there was like, I don't know, thousands a day. So like the jail people got upset and came to my cell and had a talking with me and wanted to know how I did it all or they were going to charge me with more crimes. So I sat down with their IT guy, some old dude and showed him that his computer skills were lacking (laughs) stuff and how I did all that, which was fine. So, I mean, I got to be on a computer, you know, and do things um, here and there. He spent five months in jail, and it was time for his trial. I get a public defender. Pretender is what we call them. Public pretenders. They're scaring me. They're like, dude, you're going to prison for 15 years. We got all the evidence that we need. We got you. We got AT&T saying that you called them. Saying that you called them and told them that you did this. So I was scared, though, and I wanted to get out of jail, right? And they're like, hey, if you sign here, you could get out tonight. We'll put you on probation. Done. Or we go to trial, and you'll lose. I mean, the public defender's like, you'll lose, and you'll go to prison for 15 years. But if you plea out the here, we'll lower your charge down to a third-degree felony instead of a second-degree felony, and we'll let you out tonight. And you can go home. And I'm like, all right. So I signed and pled out. But then I didn't get to go home that night. Because the judge wanted to have a whole other hearing for restitution. And I'm like, what's that word? <laughs> what's restitution mean? <laughs> it's like, oh, that's 
that's the money you gotta pay back <laughs> for the damages you caused. <laughs> and it's a lot of money. <laughs> so we're gonna have a whole hearing on that. When's a good time there, court reporter person? Oh, next month we got an opening. Oh, cool. All right, well, send them back to jail, and we'll see them next month. So I sit in jail, wait a month, come back, restitution hearing. Yeah, I get out today. Whatever the fuck y'all want to say, I want to pay. I don't care. But their lawyers didn't show up. The AT and T ding dongs, and um, they're like, oh, well, can we get a continuance? Uh, lawyers couldn't make it today. You know, um, I stand up. I'm like, fuck no. I planned out a month ago. I should have been out a month ago. I'm not going back into jail because these guys can't be respectful enough to the court to show up when you told them to be here. And then the judge is like, you know what? You're right. If they want any money from you, they're going to have to sue you. Click. No restitution. And then I, I, I did like the little deuces sign. Deuces. And then I got to go down. I got out and left. <laughs> I, I went to find the nearest ashtray to find a cigarette butt to smoke. And then I went to like McDonald's and got a cheeseburger for free because I told them that I ordered something the other day and it was because I just got out of jail. I didn't have no money. I, I ordered something the other day and they forgot to give me a cheeseburger in the bag and they're like, all right, well, here you go. And I'm like, sweet cheeseburger. Social engineering. <laughs> and then I went to go live at the Salvation Army. My man had nowhere to go after getting out of jail. So he was homeless for a while with no money and had to start from scratch. His friends were all gone. and His mom wanted nothing to do with him. Well, because she was a police officer or whatever. And I was a convicted felon <laughs> at that time. I don't know. She just, just you know, kind of disowned me. So yeah, I lived on my own, did day labor, digging ditches. Uh, you know, it was cool. I went out on one. They had a submarine once at parked at the thing and it was in for cleaning. It was like some old Russian sub or something. And we had to like shoot off the barnacles. It was pretty fun. Yeah. Laying sod, doing whatever, eventually saved some money, got a little apartment, got another job. He was starting to pick his life back up and be productive again. But then something happened. So, um, I seen I seen a crime happening one day while I was walking down the street, but it was pretty bad. It was like somebody was getting their ass whooped in and there was like a knife and and you know, all kinds of other stuff, right? So I like I'm like, oh, here's a payphone. Let me call nine one one. Let me be a good citizen to save this person's life. And um I do that. Cops come and they want to come over and talk to me. And they asked for my ID and stuff. And lo and behold, I had a warrant out for my arrest. <laughs> Apparently, I violated probation because I was on probation. And I never had a probation officer or checked in or did anything <laughs> that I was supposed to do. So I got arrested. They took me to jail. They didn't take the other dude to jail, by the way. They let him off. They just gave him a court date. The guy that was like killing somebody. So, but I get to go to jail because, you know, I violated my probation, which is fine. It's the law. So I went to jail, um, sat in jail, had to wait, go to court. And then I'm like, I don't want to get put on probation again. And apparently I can't do it. I'm like, well, we're going to put you on it again. All right, cool. So I got put on probation again. This time I actually did check in, meet with the dude. And everything's like, well, you got to get a job. You got to do this. You got to do that. I'm like, fuck that. Put me back in jail. So I went back to jail. And then I tell the judge, like, I told you I didn't want to get put on probation. Just tell me how much time I got to do. And I'll do it. And don't put me on probation. He's like, all right, well, you got to do a year. I'm like, all right, cool. I've already been sitting in here for six months. So, all right, a couple more months to go. Done. Because you get, like, extra bonus days because I was, like, a trustee. And I, I did good stuff. And you get, like, good behavior. And. So you only do like eight months out of the 12 months for a year. So I did my year, got out, free and clean, done. He gets back out, starts over from scratch again, doing day labor, earning a little bit at a time and saving up for an apartment. I eventually met a chick, um, moved down to Fort Lauderdale with her. 
she she had some money, so like I lived with her. I didn't really have to buy or pay anything or whatever. And then I got a job um, running Cat Five Cable or whatever. And then they were working on poker software, and like their programmers were like idiots. It's like I'll I'll look over their shoulder or see what they're doing because I'm running the, all the cables, and I'd go and help them like fix their little problem they're having with whatever of that day and eventually you know the boss he seen me doing that he's like hey you want to just work here and i'm like cool yeah you know so i started i was like the assistant it guy eventually i stayed with the company and everything i i just became like one of the head dudes um you know there and my knowledge just like skyrocketed from from working there um and then i started i went back to college I, i i started going to school so I put myself through college to get a degree, which is pretty much worthless. Didn't learn a lot while I was working there. And I was getting certifications. So like 200 different Microsoft certs later, um, <laughs> after I took one like like I took one like every other day <laughs> just for kicks and giggles because they're like free. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to take all these certs. So I was taking certs like every day. It was fun. The place he was working at was an online casino. But it was at this time that some harsh online gambling regulations went into effect in the U.S. So the business started to wobble, and he knew he needed to move on to something new. I eventually got in an argument and left that company and went and started my own. And, and, you know, I I made a cybersecurity company, and then I sold that company to McAfee. That's John McAfee, who started the McAfee antivirus software. But John is no longer part of McAfee and is doing his own ventures. But still, my man made some pretty good money selling his company to John. Yeah, I bought a house and car and paid off all my debts, student loans. I moved to Alabama. My man has just been living a nice, relaxing life for the last few years, which brings us up to now. Now, um, just hanging out, I'm looking for a job. A lot of the now I'm in I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, and the scenery here is all DOD. The everybody has clearance secret clearance and all that obviously me with my criminal past i don't have the clearances so a lot of people won't touch me or hire me so i just i do um contract work and i'm actually looking into maybe even starting a like a recruitment company because i know so many people and i like to help and i'm really good at you know, making resumes and getting place and knowing if somebody's full of shit or not. But I think I'm probably going to be one of them people where I just have to keep doing my own companies and my own thing. Uh, unless somebody gives me a chance to, you know, show them that I'm not a criminal <laughs> or whatever, you know, like a lot of companies are scared of me. Oh, and remember sub seven, apparently while he was in jail and homeless and struggling, that malware became really popular. Thousands of people started becoming familiar with it. Oh, this was more than thousands. <laughs> I know nowadays, you know, millions of people know about Sub7. Because I know it's still being used in China and, and India and, and a few other places. Um, it's, a, it's very, very weird to see that it's still out there and in the wild um, and working to this day. After a while, mob man would go and attend security and hacker conferences. Then I started seeing like the impact that it had on the industry and changing a lot of the people. And like, you know, I'll go to DEF CON or whatnot, and like people come up to me and they're like, oh man, we use Sub 7. And everybody tells me a story about their use of Sub 7. Some people that, you know, run these billion dollar cybersecurity companies, they come up to me and they're billionaires. And they're like, dude, man, you got me the one that got me into computers. Like, I wouldn't be where I was today without Sub7. I'm like, you owe me a beer. They're like, whatever you want, man. Well, let's go to the bar. You buy everything's on me. You know, so it's like, cool, because I'm, you know, poor. So, <laughs> so <laughs> or I was. It's hard to tell, but some people claim that Sub7 was the first remote access tool that became popular with hackers. A few other Trojans came out around the same time. And so with that, you know, it's history kind of historical software. A few years back, Mobman saw an article online, and it said that AT&T found an error in their billing system, which ended up in a class action lawsuit. And it said the errors in their billing system dated all the way back to when Mobman was erroneously hit with that $900 phone bill. And I'm like, yep, I've been saying that for years. I've been telling them their shit was broken for years. 
So yeah, AT and T burn in hell. So like when they come on my lawn and they ask me if I want to get AT and T internet, it's like oh, I feel bad for that sales guy. Yeah, <laughs> so troll him. <laughs> What did you say to him? Dude, I go I go down and file restraining orders <laughs> at the courthouse against them. If they send me one letter in the mail, I go down and file something at the courthouse. Like I get I'm livid against that company. I just don't like see the only thing I learned, like I, I don't have no anger issues or anything. The only thing that ever upsets me in life, you can do whatever you want to me. You accuse me of something I did not do. I get upset, but I've learned to control it. I'm not going to go and hack you or, <laughs> or do something, you know, but that's the only thing that really pisses me off in life is like being accused of something I didn't do. So, and, it, and, you know, it, it upsets me when I go to a lot of companies and they think that I'm going to do this and this and that or whatever, like if they upset me, you know, I'm going to fuck all their shit up or something, you know, that's, that's, you know, it's, that's ridiculous, but whatever. It is what it is. You've been listening to Darknet Diaries. If you want to help support this show, head on over to darknetdiaries.com slash love. There you'll find the best ways to support this show, including a link to the Patreon page and a shop where you can buy t-shirts and stickers. This show is made entirely by me, Jack Reese Sider, and the theme music is by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts bovenaan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.a0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70 megahertzshop.nl. 70mhzshop.nl
Ik heb een microfoon naar de toer.